The prom was two months away, and I was getting ready to ask Tracy to be my date for the prom. I know some guys ask their girlfriends three months in advance, but I didn't need to, because Tracy was my girlfriend. Always been my girlfriend. And prom was a done deal. Hell, prom had been a done deal since I turned five. Tracy Batson and I were neighbors, since her family moved next door to mine when I was five and she was four. We met a few days after the family moved in. I was playing alone in the backyard when I noticed someone running toward me. I got up just in time when she reached me. A short cropped blonde girl with green eyes and freckles all over her face. She reached out to me and hugged me tightly. I let her do it. When we uncoupled, she knelt down next to me and started playing with my Tonka trucks. That was it. No fanfare. Best friends forever. Tracy and I didn't play together every day. Sometimes she went off to play with the girls. Sometimes I went off to play with the boys, but most of the time we played with Tracy, me, and the others when they showed up. I was well aware that she was a girl, but for some reason I never looked at her the same way I looked at the other girls. Sometimes the other girls had lice. I don't know why, but Tracy never had it. We remained best friends through elementary, middle, and high school. While other boys and girls were starting to pair up, Tracy and I were already a couple. Other couples were going on dates, and Tracy and I were just doing something together. It wasn't a date. We were just doing what we'd always done. I was 14 and she was 13 when we had our first kiss. And like everything else for us, it was done lightly and without fanfare. We were coming out of an evening movie theater. I put my arm around her waist. She snuggled up to me and we kissed. It was nothing special for the two of us, though I knew we both felt something electric. We kissed many more times after that. Our parents seemed to take everything for granted. I was part of her family and she was part of mine. I could count on being yelled at or spanked if I misbehaved in her house, and the same was true of her if she misbehaved in mine. Our friends also took our relationship calmly, perhaps because it seemed like we were always together. In the neighborhood, it was clear that we were together and no one tried to come between us. Outside the neighborhood, it was different, and Tracy had guys running after her. She was developed in all the right places, and while I was always worried that she would find someone she wanted more than me, I never worried too much because we were we. She was mine and I was hers. End of story. At least that's what I thought. As always, after class ended, Tracy met me at my car in the parking lot. As we drove home, I looked away and asked where she wanted to go after graduation. Silence. Five seconds. Ten. Fifteen. This was not good. I pulled off to the side of the road as soon as I could find an open spot. Pulling over, I put the car in park and turned my full attention to Tracy, who had started crying and looked like she had just eaten a bag of lemons. Yeah, yeah. I already told Justin Morrow that I was going to the prom with him, Stevie, Tracy whispered. My breath caught for a second. I shook my head in disbelief, then looked straight into Tracy's eyes. He invited me over last month. I thought it would be fun to go with someone else. You know, a different guy, a different perspective. You know, there's always me and you. What's the big deal? Ah! I thought my head was going to explode. What the hell is going on, Tracy? Another perspective? You gotta be kidding me. She burst into tears. I started to reach out to comfort her, but then common sense hit me over the head. We are an us, Tracy. We are we, I screamed. You're my girlfriend. My girlfriend wouldn't go to prom with another guy just for another prospect. Look, Stevie, I've never dated another guy, and you've never dated another girl. You know you're going away to college in a few months, and we're both going to have to date other people. At least, Tracy? Why didn't you wait until I was gone? That would have been kind-hearted at the very least. Tracy mumbled something, sobbing. I wasn't even listening, turning on the transmission and driving us home. At home, I grumbled for four days. I didn't go home to Tracy and she didn't come home to me. Both parents weren't born yesterday. I found out from Joyce that Tracy was going to the prom with Justin Morrow. Joyce cried, telling me that, Stevie, 
Anything you want to add? Mom asked at dinner on the fourth day. Dad raised both eyebrows. My little sister Ellie fidgeted in her chair. Only that you and Joyce can stop making wedding plans for us. We're sorry, Stevie. We really are. You know, if you need to talk, Dad said. Does anyone need two tickets to the prom? I asked, trying to sound like I was joking. Justin Morrow was more of an acquaintance than a friend. I had no idea if he knew Tracy and I were a couple, but it didn't matter. If Tracy was really mine, she would have told Justin about it, not consented. I went around moping for a couple weeks, and then as I was getting out of the car one day after school, I heard Allison Warnock giggling about something with a few of her friends. Allison was the younger sister of Laura Warnock, who lived across the street from me and hung out with a common group of friends in the neighborhood. Laura had been friends with me for about as long as Tracy had been, and was probably Tracy's second best friend after me. At least until three weeks ago. Allison was a freshman at our high school, about six foot three, skinny as a rail, blonde hair, and completely adorable. I'd known Allison since I was two years old, and we'd always gotten along great. She was a bit of a weirdo and reckless, and was often my partner when we'd have chicken fights on the lawn or in the pool, and she'd sit on my shoulders. She was so light that I could carry her with one arm, which gave me the opportunity to use my free hand to wrestle, knocking our team to a distinct advantage. In any case, I'd never really seen Allison as anything more than a skinny, flat-chested sissy until now, but I'll admit I'd always had a special place for my chicken wrestling partner. Hell, I already had tickets, so I made a somewhat awkward request. I pulled her away from the twins, another pair of 15-year-olds from our neighborhood, and simply asked her to be my date. Her alabaster face turned bright pink, and she lowered her eyes to the ground. I knew I'd caught her off guard. Shouldn't you ask my sister since you're not going with Tracy? You've always been one of her closest friends, she said, raising her gaze to my face at the last second. No, I have to ask the Warnock girl I really want to go with, which is you, even if there are no chicken fights at prom. I'm not asking you to be Tracy's replacement. I'm asking you to be my friend. Can I ask mom and dad first? I'd like to go, but until I turn 16, dad says I have to ask permission. Oh yeah, I don't want Big Ed to be mad at me, I replied. Allison's father, Big Ed, was a bear, six foot, 100 pounds, and no sane person would want him mad at him. But as much as I feared Big Ed, I knew that the real strength in the family was Allison's mother, Barbara, who was a full-blown Irish Catholic, the kind of woman everyone read about in legends. God forbid the boy should touch any of her daughters. Barbara would surely rip off both his ears and scratch out both his eyes. That evening, the phone rang, but not to me. Barb called directly to her boss, my mom, and I heard Mom assure Barb in great detail that I would be a complete gentleman. When Mom gives her word, that's just the way it goes, which was fine with me. The next morning, before I could even get to my locker, Laura was already in my face and scolding me. What the hell, Stevie? Am I chopped liver? We've been friends forever, spend half our time together, and you're inviting my little sister to prom? What's wrong? Laura practically yelled at me. I held up my hands in a sign of surrender. Up until a few weeks ago, I was sure I was going to the prom with Tracy, but I guess I was wrong, I said. After she figuratively kicked me in the balls, I wasn't going to go at all. Then I decided I was going to go, but just for fun, with no strings attached. Allison makes me laugh, and I want to laugh. We'll go and have fun, and then I'll graduate and go to school. Laura let out a small shriek and then inhaled about half of the oxygen in the hallway while everyone watched us. She looked at me intently and then snorted. I looked at everyone looking at me, shrugged, and went to my first class of the day. I think I lost two friends. Graduation was as good as I could have hoped for. Allison looked stunning in her navy blue dress, with her hair styled and wearing makeup for the first time. I never once had the urge to throw her on my shoulders for a chicken fight, 
but definitely had the urge to pull her close to me for a slow dance, which I did. As early as the second dance, she snuggled up against my body, and so we danced for the rest of the evening. Yes, I saw Tracy and Justin from afar a few times during the evening. Yes, she looked lovely in a rather body-hugging green dress, and truth be told, Justin looked rather solid in a black suit. When I saw them, they seemed to be enjoying themselves. Truth be told, I didn't try to pay attention to Tracy and Justin because I really enjoyed spending time with Allison. She was both fun, funny, and sexy in a skinny chick kind of way. A few times I thought she was going to turn into a real heartbreaker in the next year or so. I almost wished I could stay here to see that prediction come true. We went to a very late breakfast at a local IHOP with a few other couples, then I drove us home. I parked in front of my house and walked her across the street to the front porch. Then I mustered up the courage to give her a real good night kiss, with a little tongue action before she hugged me tighter and ran her tongue over mine. We did it a second time after that, until I heard a rustling outside the Warnock's door and decided I should take the hint and walk home. The following Saturday morning after prom night, Tracy walked into my house as she had done for years until two months ago. My mom and I looked at each other in surprise as Tracy walked over to the couch in the family room and pulled herself over to me. She sat in silence for about a minute while we watched Premier League soccer and then whispered in my ear that we needed to talk on the back patio. I protested but caught the look on my mom's face and realized I should follow Tracy outside. Don't you think this has gone on long enough, Stevie? Graduation has been over for a week and you're still not talking to me? Like I told you, it was a one-time thing. I dated someone else, and so did you. Although I have to say, you surprised me with your choice. You certainly didn't make Laura happy. I wasn't trying to make Laura happy. I was trying to make myself happy, I grumbled. Okay, you made yourself happy, I guess, but now it's time to get back to normal. I'm back, I'm yours, and you're mine, I said. At least until the next time you decide to take a break from me, I interrupted. Tracy looked embarrassed. I can't say I didn't enjoy prom, but I'm over it. We're back to being us again, Stevie, she said. No, Tracy, we'll never be us again, I said. You're done with us forever. Don't be like that, Stevie, Tracy replied, holding back tears. I got up from the chair, went into the house, grabbed my car keys, and left. An hour later, after Tracy gave up and went home, my mom texted me. Over the summer, until I left for college, I went out with Allison a few times. We always had fun, but we were both realistic. I had four years of college ahead of me, and she had three years of high school. We agreed that we'd be better off going our separate ways, though we didn't rule out casual dates in the summer when I'd be home. A little after New Year's Eve, I got a call from Tracy's high school. It was her senior year in prom. She was calling to let me know that she was making amends for ruining my prom and that I could invite her to prom this year. It's a generous offer, I told her, but I'm just not ready for it. I suggested that maybe Justin was available. Since they had a good time last year, maybe they should do it again. She quietly hung up the phone. Over the summer, when I was home, Tracy would occasionally come over to me and make snide remarks that we should get back together. She even hinted to both of my parents that she and I should get back together. This also explains why I had to endure an hour-long lecture from her mother about how good we were together and that I was wrong to not see the forest for the trees. Of course, because of our whole history with Tracy's mom, I was polite, but I still couldn't give her an answer that would make her happy. For his part, Tracy's dad couldn't look me in the eye. I think he agreed with my position, but didn't want to say it out loud. I knew that Allison had had her share of dating— eventually turning into a real stunning beauty when she finally got in shape and had small but firm breasts. I went on dates too, since I'm a pretty decent guy with a healthy sex drive. I'd tracked Allison enough to know that she didn't have a steady boyfriend in the middle of her senior year, so when I was home for Christmas, I asked her if she wanted me to be with her for prom. She smiled broadly and said, yes. 
Three years had made Allison's body and mind more mature, but even though she had grown into a real hot babe, she never let her beauty overshadow her fun-loving personality. We had a great time at the prom, and an even better time afterward as we got to know each other better for the first time. Hoping for this outcome, I had booked a hotel room, but I wasn't about to push Allison into it. We started the evening as great friends, and just like three years ago, Allison pressed her whole body against me every time we hit the dance floor. Her lips tasted delicious, and we spent quite a bit of time kissing. Toward the end of the night, I asked if she wanted to have some more fun with her friends, or if she wanted to go to the hotel with me. She didn't seem surprised or upset that I had gotten us a room. I had a bottle of champagne and a container of strawberries in the room. We took our time in bed, kissing, joking, laughing, and talking. I don't know how long we did that until we were in front of the bed where I carefully began to remove her burgundy silk and lace dress. As I slowly stripped her down to her burgundy bra and panties, she looked nothing like the skinny tomboyish girl I remembered as a 12-year-old kid. We both stripped down to my underwear before I focused on her again. Since Allison was a regular kid, I assumed she wasn't a virgin, but I didn't think she had too much experience with sex, and it only took me a few minutes to be convinced I was right. We snuggled quietly against each other for a while before we started talking and laughing again. We got dressed and left, and I brought Allison home by 1.45 a.m., 15 minutes ahead of Big Ed's deadline for that night. Allison and I were together for the summer after her graduation, but drifted apart again when she left for her freshman year of college in Iowa, and I left for my senior year of college in Indiana. We emailed occasionally, and although we remained great friends, we both knew we were going in different directions. I was graduating college in May, and she had three more years of school ahead of her. They say timing is everything, and our timing just didn't seem to match up. I had to give Tracy credit for her persistence. She kept her finger on the pulse of the game with periodic emails, gently reminding me that she would drop everything in a heartbeat if I just said the word. I politely reminded her that our ships had parted at night and we both had our own lives. I got a good job at a mid-sized accounting firm in Ohio and started studying for my master's degree, thinking I wanted to be a college professor someday. I know that sounds arcane, but I really enjoyed communicating with people through math. While taking college courses, I interacted with many female students, and my social life was shaping up more in that direction than any other, until Molly entered my world and pulled me out of my meager existence. Molly was a divorced woman with a child who had recently started working in the audit department at my firm. With long, bright orange hair, freckles everywhere, and skin whiter than white, she was a perfect redhead. She also had big breasts and captivating green eyes that I didn't notice until one day during a birthday party in the office break room when she spilled hot coffee on my shirt. Everyone knows what I'm talking about. Coffee and cake for a co-worker in the break room. Apparently, she took her cake a little before I did, but as she turned to walk away from the table, the square of cake she had just taken flew off her plate, and in an attempt to stop it, she jerked her left hand to the side, creating a splatter that hit my chest. It hurt like hell that I remember. But when I looked up, I was lost in those green eyes, and suddenly I stopped feeling pain. It wasn't until another co-worker rushed over to me with paper towels and started blotting it up that I felt the touch again and cried out in pain. Molly immediately started apologizing, and I left to go to the bathroom. An hour later... Those mesmerizing green eyes appeared in my office with another piece of cake. And in another five minutes, I had a date for the following Friday evening. I have to admit, I was shocked when I rang Molly's doorbell on Friday night and it was opened by a teenager with red hair. He had to be at least 16 years old, which meant Molly was probably older than I'd realized. Not that I was put off by her age, but I was surprised when she admitted that she was 42. She later told me that she had been married for 16 years and divorced for four years. She looked gorgeous in what I would call mom's version of the infamous little black dress, as it was a couple of inches above her knees and revealed just a hint of her large breasts. 
I tried not to be too conspicuous because I knew her son was watching me. Perhaps because Molly was raising a teenager, she seemed very knowledgeable about the world of youth despite her age. It took me about five minutes to come to terms with it all, but after that, it seemed just like any other date I'd ever had. We enjoyed a delicious meal and then went to a concert organized by the local Philharmonic. Not the wildest date I've ever been on, but good enough that I knew I wanted to try more. Maybe it had to do with her age, but I was a little timid before making a sexual move on Molly. She was certainly sexy enough, but something about her intimidated me, to say the least. However, she clearly noticed that something was off, and on our sixth date, she broached the subject. We had a bourbon and barbecue night and then went to a country western dance club for some dancing. Neither of us had ever danced before, but we had a great time learning from the veterans at the club. I held on to Molly all night, and I knew she was picking up the vibe of the night. But I was once again agonizing over how I should start when Molly put her hands behind my heed and pulled me to her for a heated kiss. Her body was pressed against me, and I know she could feel my arousal. I know my age bothers you, Stevie, but I'm not going to break the buzz. We have to end this night horizontal, Molly whispered. An embarrassed smile spread across my face from ear to ear. I took her hand and led her out of the club. Even though Molly was the oldest woman I had ever slept with, she was incredibly energetic and knew how to use her experience. Ah, Stevie, ah, she screamed during her first ecstasy. About a year later, a wedding invitation came in the mail and made me slow down dramatically. It turned out that Allison had graduated from college about a year before and was getting married to a man she had dated in her senior year. We stopped texting and I lost sight of her. She was now living in Illinois, but the wedding was to be held in New York, where her parents still lived. I took Molly with me and explained how everyone fit into this neighborhood celebration, because that's how it really was. My parents, Big Ed, Barb, and Laura, Tracy, and her parents were there. Drew Goldstein seemed like a nice enough guy, but it took a lot of internal reflection for me to be happy for Allison. I never got over my feelings for her, but that's just not meant to be. Shit happens, you have to move on. That said, I probably didn't make either Allison or Drew happy when she first introduced him to me a couple days before the wedding. We had that history, and I was probably as close to an older brother as she was to accepting me as such. I'm very happy for you, Drew, but hear me out, and hear me out carefully, I said sharply, keeping a smile on my face. If you offend her, I'll break your nose. Got it? Both Alice and Andrew seemed a little stunned by my statement. Drew had the good sense to nod understandingly as I shook his hand. Later, Laura told me that Big Ed approved of my threat. Tracy had apparently finally forgotten about me. She showed up with her husband in tow and a pregnancy belly. He looked like he stepped out of a 60s biker movie, and neither Joyce nor Tim Batson looked very pleased. Tracy and I hardly spoke all weekend, but when we did talk, we were polite. Molly and I never sought exclusivity, and I knew she was seeing others while I preferred not to. We never discussed others until a few months after Allison's wedding, when Molly cooked a sumptuous Irish dinner and told me she had news for me. Turns out she's been dating a nice guy a couple years older than herself for most of the time she's been dating me, and he's been talking about exclusivity. She decided she had to let me know this information. I wasn't completely surprised by that statement and certainly couldn't blame her if she wanted to go for a more secure relationship. Besides, the two of them probably had more in common. She started to show emotion and seemed to even apologize, but I gently stopped her. Never apologize for doing what's right for you, baby, I said. You've always been completely upfront and honest with me. If you want a commitment and he can give it and I can't, that's on me. You are a beautiful woman and a beautiful soul. I hope everything works out wonderfully for you too. I really meant what I said. I got up from the table, kissed her very gently on the cheek and left. In a conversation about five years later, my mom broke the somewhat sad news of Allison's divorce. 
I say somewhat sad because, truth be told, I still had some feelings for the woman, but really, it's always sad when someone's marriage goes down. From my perspective, you marry someone thinking it's going to be a lifelong commitment, and when it turns out not to be, it's devastating. I felt sorry for her, but I didn't try to contact her because we didn't keep in touch. I was more than surprised when I got a text from Allison six months later. It said, Are you still there? I guessed that she wasn't sure if I still had the same phone number. I was very surprised to see who the message was from, but I didn't respond to it for about three days. Eventually, I replied with a meaningless reply. Yes. Another three days passed before I got a call one evening. Got a few minutes for an old friend? She asked. I really need to spend some time with a non-relative or friend who is trying to cheer me up. I know we haven't socialized much over the years, but you've always been honest with me and made me laugh. It's been a long time since I've enjoyed a good laugh. Not being a beautiful woman, I didn't realize how hard Allison had it in the years since our breakup. In college and beyond, she was always picking out a date, being invited to all sorts of events and outings, and it must have been exhausting. When she married Drew, the handsome son of a prominent financier from Illinois, it seemed like the good times would go on forever, as they both got good jobs with his father's company and enjoyed a very comfortable life in a new home in the Chicago suburbs. Things took a turn for the worse when she found out that Drew had been cheating on her for at least a year with the daughter of an old family friend. I agreed to go to Chicago for a long weekend to give her a shoulder to lean on. I know she sounded upset on the phone but was shocked when she showed up at the door of her apartment in a bad part of town. She looked like she hadn't eaten or showered in days and her eyes seemed hunted. What happened to my little chicken wrestling friend? She looked like crap. Sure enough, my mouth dropped open and then she started crying. Like most guys, I get completely lost in the presence of a crying woman. All I could do was hug Allison and walk her back to the apartment. We spent the next two hours on the shabby couch while she sobbed into my shirt and confusedly recounted her grief. After finding out about the affair, Allison kicked Drew out of the house, but then Drew's father got involved. Allison didn't read the prenup she signed with Drew, and nine months later, Allison was divorced and living in that apartment, with no job and almost no life. Drew's father had made sure that his HR department destroyed any chance Allison had of getting a good job in the area, and she was working at a dry cleaner's. Friday night and all day Saturday, Allison and I talked a lot. As soon as I got to her apartment, we hugged, but after that, the most physical thing we did was occasionally hold hands while we talked. It just didn't feel right. I was also uncomfortable seeing Allison so broken and the way her life was turning out. I needed to give her a clean break, so I turned to the only man I knew who cared about Allison more than I did. I explained the situation to Big Ed as I understood it, and he promised that he and Barb would be in Chicago the next morning to take Allison home to upstate New York. When I broke the news to Allison, she almost ripped my ears off, but I knew it was the right move. As I helped her pack her meager belongings, she still called me every name she knew. I'm a 30-year-old woman. I don't need to be treated like a 5-year-old girl, asshole, was one of the nicest things she said to me while I was helping her pack on Monday. I kept in touch with Allison weekly through Big Ed and Barb. Allison steadfastly refused to talk to me. My life went on. I dated several women, including one for almost a year. I was close to asking her the big question when she told me she had met someone she wanted to date and didn't want to cheat on me, so we were required to break up. I told her I appreciated her honesty and returned my deposit for the engagement ring I had purchased. About six months after sending Allison back to New York, I took a couple days off and went to Chicago for the weekend. Did some homework and waited outside Drew Goldstein's Mercedes when he got off work Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock. When I approached him in the parking lot, he didn't seem to remember me right away. But as soon as I took my seat, I saw a spark of recognition flash in his eyes but he no longer had time to raise his arms, and I attacked him with all the strength I had in my six-foot-three, eighty-two-pound body. 
I felt his nose explode and blood splattered everywhere as he fell to the ground. I warned you what would happen if you hurt Allison. Apparently you forgot. I haven't, I said quietly. Interestingly, even though there were a lot of people in the parking lot who saw me hitting Drew, not one made a move to help him or stop me from leaving. I guess the boss's son just wasn't popular. Just a few hours later, I was back in Indiana, still expecting the police to show up at my door because of my attack on Drew, and was surprised when that didn't happen. I was also surprised two weeks later when I got a call from Allison. A bird on my tail told me that a couple of weeks ago you gave Drew a nose job, Allison said. I thought you were just being a jerk by threatening him all these years. Now I don't know how to thank you. By the way, Dad said he'd send you a bottle of 18-year-old Glenn Morangi. I had a different suggestion for how Allison could thank me, and I took a week's vacation to help her with that. We spent most of that week together, and by the time I left to return to Indiana, we had become a monogamous couple, but long distance. We lived long distance for about six months, after which she came to live with me in Indiana. Big Ed and Barb weren't totally agreeable to those terms, but given our history, gave us some leeway. That only lasted about a year, however, as two months later, Allison accepted my marriage proposal, and ten months after that, we were married. I love irony. So we were married exactly 17 years from the day of our first date, my high school graduation. Epilogue. It may have taken us a long time to be together, but as they say, good things are worth waiting for. Allison and I had just celebrated our 30th anniversary at a party thrown by our children, Eddie and Rosalie, and their spouses. It wasn't always perfect, but it was as close as I probably deserve. By the way, we get a Christmas card from Tracy every year. She has a fourth husband and four children who are now 25 years old. Although I didn't know it at the time, someone upstairs was looking out for me.